Welcome to the Believe Podcast Network, SoCal Sweat. My name is Ann McDaniels, a former NFL cheerleader and product manager turned actress and model who dreams of being a UFC fighter. Meow. Learning strategies to help motivate others leads me to bring you interviews each week from a range of athletes, experts in fitness and nutrition, and so much more. Thanks for listening to Believe, the number one podcast for working professionals, and let's push our endorphins to higher performance through SoCal Sweat. This is your host, Ann McDaniels, and welcome to another episode of Believe SoCal Sweat. It is Wednesday, the day before the American Thanksgiving, and people are stressed out. It should be a really fun time, so let's really enjoy it. The top two things that people stress about are families and friends and having to please others and being able to get there on time, bringing the right dish to pass, all the politics in the air. But the second one would be anything around your weight and health goals, whether that be weight management, weight loss, weight gain, what have you. But my guest today, Cheryl McCoglin, is going to talk about the keto diet and a lot of lifestyle things. However, I just want to give you eight quick tips in avoiding Thanksgiving weight gain. There are so many things you can just add into your regimen that will help you to avoid those extra calories or work out those extra calories. The first would be to work out when you can. Maybe you can get a quick, brisk walk that morning, do a turkey trot. Maybe you can go to the gym among meals, between meals, whatever you can do. Eat a good breakfast, so then you're not starving yourself all day and then gorging like, you know, like you haven't eaten for years. If you intermittent fast, you know your regimen, you can do what works for you, of course. How about bringing a healthy dish to pass and eat? Maybe you wanna bring a salad with a ton of protein to add to the Thanksgiving feast besides everything else, or a healthy dessert. Bring something you can do to control. Number four is to pick and choose your indulgences. Maybe you will like every single pie and every single dessert. You can absolutely do that. Maybe just prop, you know practice proper portion control and choose maybe every single protein that you love and just do little bits of each. Maybe your indulgence is carbs and you know what? It's the greatest carbs on earth during Thanksgiving, so just indulge. But if it makes you feel guilty, then make sure to get some physical activity in or do any, any of the other things to do. Also, number five is to slow down. Thanksgiving anyway is all about giving thanks and appreciation for what we have. We are pretty lucky in this world and even if things are horrible the fact that we can even be together I will be doing volunteer work all day because it's very important to me to give back because I realize how privileged that I am but it's to slow down and chew your food every single time you put a a morsel of food in your mouth because they are wonderful indulgences that we get to do on this day slow it down and enjoy don't eat like a dog where you (laughs) where you give a dog and it's like it's a wonderful treat and like you don't even chew chew it dog don't swallow it whole. That's not fun. You, have to, you don't even like tasting it. You might as well eat something healthy if you're going to do that, you know? So slow it down. I really enjoy the, the taste and flavor and all the love that went into making it. And go easy on the adult beverages, but you know what? Hey, a lot of a lot of Thanksgivings are stressful. If you need a drink and you need to put up with your Aunt Mabel, whatever you have you, um, drink those adult beverages. But do realize how many uh, high calories they, there are, especially with the Holiday drinks, especially if there's the eggnogs. Oh my God, they're so good. All those bourbons, everything. But just, you know, maybe add spritzers and add a couple glasses of water between or among drinks. That always helps. Number seven is just get, to get active. Go outside and play football with your family and friends afterwards. After And then come in and watch the game. Just something to move your body. And then number eight is shift your focus. A lot of times there are seconds, thirds, fourths, and then the whole buffet is put out again a couple hours later. I know that's, in my family, that's what we do and it's great. And then you can make sandwiches, then you can take things home, and I will do another podcast on Thanksgiving leftovers and how we can do that. But instead of doing that, shift your focus. Again, go inside and play football. Play a game. Get together on a walk, or maybe just have some great conversations with other adult beverages, and then stay out of the kitchen. So those are the top eight. It would be work out when you can, eat breakfast, bring a healthy dish to pass, pick and choose your indulgences, slow down, go easy on the adult beverages, and again, do what you need to do there. Pick your battles. Stay active and shift the focus to something else that would be away from the desserts and the extra food. But the ultimate expert in everything that I mentioned is going to be my interview today with Cheryl McColgan. And she owns the company called Heal, Nourish, Grow. She has so much life experience. She's been in advanced nutrition, ultimate wellness, and she leads a healthy and fun lifestyle. Her intention is to share her experience and insight through unique content that will help you transform and live your best life. Her hope is that what she's learned over the years of experience in experimenting with nutrition, yoga, fitness, self-exploration, psychology, meditation, and creativity 
will inspire you to lead your best and healthiest, most fulfilling and most important fun life. She has a husband and children. She plans to have grandchildren in the future and to always age gracefully. She practices intermittent fasting and keto and has wonderful recipes on her YouTube, her website, her socials at Heal Nourish Grow. Today I have Cheryl McColgan and she owns the company Heal Nourish Grow. Cheryl, thank you so much for coming on today. She comes from, to us from beautiful Cincinnati, Ohio. Do you have all the leaves changed or has it started to snow yet? Oh gosh, no snow yet, but it's, it's in the forecast and uh, most of the leaves are already down. In fact, I think my husband was going to take off work a little early today to deal with our gutters. So <laughs> there's plenty oh. of leaves down already. And raking is a really good workout. I had covered that in a, in a last podcast and burning calories during the holidays that you don't even realize and making money. So you can, you can put them to work in the neighborhood, make, make extra money. <laughs> <There we go. laughs> um, so would you please tell us a little bit about your background? I know that you have, I'm fascinated by the fact that you have studied psychology and addictions of food and everything like that. Can you just give us a little snapshot of your upbringing in sports, nutrition, or dance? And I know you grew up on a farm. Tell us about the whole foods that you grew up on. We'd love to hear your uh, backstory. Yeah, so I, I did grow up on a farm, about a 50 acre farm in Louisiana. And I also, my grandma, one of my grandmas was French Cajun and my other grandma was just a very good country cook and we had lots of fresh food around. So I just feel really fortunate that I, at a young age was exposed to a lot of whole foods, a lot of really healthy food, um, food from our big, huge garden. And so, um, so yeah, the, the food thing's always been a huge part of my life. And obviously growing up near New Orleans where they have, I think some of the best food in the world. And I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world with my job and for fun. And the food in Louisiana is just absolutely amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> so that was a wonderful way to be introduced to the world of food. Uh, then as I got older, I uh, ended up being a runner for 17 years. I had to quit because of my knees, but um, so it's always just been a passion and a focus of mine to be very focused on both health and nutrition. And that hasn't always looked the same over the years, uh, but I feel like I'm always open to new information. I'm always open to experimenting. And so I've pretty much tried it all at this point as far as diets. Yeah. Um, and then in school, I was more focused on mental health because my degree is in psychology and my minor was in addiction studies. Uh, then I ended up going to grad school for a year for psychology. Unfortunately, I didn't get to finish that, but I did have a uh, clinical training and practice while I was there and got to learn how to read research and look for really good research, learned about all the considerations. So now that when I'm writing and doing all the stuff I do with Heal, Nourish, Grow, as far as articles and things, I'm able to really understand studies a lot better and to really look for good study design so that I know the difference between, okay, this study is really kind of meaningless versus a study that might actually give us some more good insight. So that's- And that's a really good point because like, I noticed you talked about the, the double blind studies, the half blind studies, because things come out in magazines and on Instagram and things that people read and it's so misconstrued. I mean, that could be paid for by the meat industry and then we don't know these things. So it's just really good that you um, kind of really study that and showcase that because I mean, even, didn't you talk about a study about bugs a, like an entomologist who was studying like the the nutrition of bugs and that was another study that oh you had highlighted yes i think um you might be talking about the protein sparing modified fast it was uh yeah. two guys names i can't think of their names off the top of my head but i can um maybe send them to you later so you can put them in the show notes if you want but um sure. they basically did some research on locusts and what they found was that the locusts uh, that were eating the highest level of protein were the leanest locusts. And, you know, it's all obviously questionable, does what happens in a locust metabolism actually apply to humans? But then they did some human studies later on as well. So it's some pretty interesting research and I'll, um, I'll find that link and I'll shoot it over to you in case anybody's interested in learning more. But the gist of the whole thing was basically that having the proper level of protein can really uh, help you get lean and stay satiated. Absolutely. And that, that occurs in nature. So as you said, it's the locust that does that. Now, growing up on a farm and then kind of changing with all these things and then keto, did anybody sort of naysay, um, well, this, this is the real way to eat. And especially growing up in Louisiana and Ohio, I'm originally from Wisconsin and there's just a certain way of eating and it's kind of in mass quantity sometimes and things are fried. When you try to, um, when you eat that way, 
do you get people saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, our ancestors have eaten this all of our lives, especially when you went vegetarian, because you went vegetarian for seven years, correct? Yes, um, and there wasn't a whole lot of, I would say the one thing about the South is uh, in general, there is a lot of unhealthy eating and- and But it's so good. I know, <laughs> and it, but that would be kind of, unhealthy, really based on almost anyone's definition of it, you know? Yeah. Um, so there was never any like real pushback from my family in particular, but also I, I wasn't really eating any specific kind of way when I still lived in the South. Now, uh, as I eat, you know, low carb keto style and have for the last almost six years now, I would definitely say that, you know, people definitely have questions. They definitely ask about it. Uh, people wonder if it's healthy long-term. And the thing that I just have to keep going back to, if you really look at how we evolved to eat, it's pretty unlikely that having the amount of carbs that we have in the regular lifestyle and the standard American diet is anything that's actually healthy for us because that was just never available to us in our past when we were hunter-gatherers. and. You know, even the hunter gatherers, it's not like they were gathering things. Everything that we look at as a vegetable or a fruit now has been bred for the most part for the ability to be easily transported and to taste very sweet. So if you had found, if you gotten lucky enough to find an apple in nature when you were a hunter gatherer that hadn't been like a modern version of an apple, it would be oh, about a quarter of the size of most apples that you find in the grocery store and hardly any sweetness to it. So if, if you wanna to go to be like, what should people really be eating? I think all you have to do is look at it from a very common sense approach as to how we evolved to eat and then go from there. The, the other argument I hear sometimes when you say that people say, well, oh, but we live so much longer now. And it has to be like, because you know we're, we're eating healthier and we're doing all this stuff. Well, really, I heard this stat recently and it was um, a doctor out of, um, the UK. And he said, what would you attribute the longer lifespan to? Because something like 70 years ago, our expected lifespan was maybe the age of 40 and now it's nearly doubled. And he would say, well, how much, and I'll just pose this question to you just out of curiosity, how much percent of that would you say is from modern, um, modern medicine advances people living longer like what percent of that lifespan increase would you say is i mean well especially in knowing athletes i mean look at all the nutrition i mean look at the size of people now mm -hmm. i mean girls are also developing so early mm -hmm. i used to teach dance and these 13 and 14 year old girls i don't mean to be gross but they were so developed and i felt like a child compared to them all the meat and dairy all the hormones and the foods and the fact that um, I come from a big football family. The impact of the quarterbacks, like my dad said, if he played in the NFL today, mm -hmm. the fact that how hard he would get hit um, is just so much bigger. I mean, obviously we have the steroids and things like that, but we also have so, such huge advances in creatine and natural hormones and HGH and things like that. And the nutrition is, everything we eat is being pumped with steroids and antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So we are getting bigger. And, um, so I would say, gosh, 60% of the, it's from the food and maybe even the vitamins, the advancement of vitamins. I mean, even people's teeth are better due to the fluoride treatments and things like that. So I don't know, it's, I'm curious, what would, what would be that percentage? Yeah, there, it's definitely interesting. And I'd love to delve more into this topic at some point, but he was saying in relation to medicine, because people always say, well, it can't be how we eat and stuff. It's, or it's gotta be, you know, can't be healthy to eat all this meat, all this kind of thing. But only about 10% of that, that extra lifespan is attributed to like, the modern medical miracle and pharmaceuticals most of the improvement in our lifespan can actually be contributed to like public health measures like simple things like hand washing and vaccines i mean not talking about the, the present one but like previous vaccines like polio and some of these things where there was a really high uh, rate of you know, childhood death, we've, we've eliminated all of those things. Yeah. So don't look to big pharma and medicine to be why we're living longer. I think, you know, it's all these public health measures and how we're eating, if anything, is probably affecting us negatively for the most part, for the way that most people eat. Absolutely. And that part is opinion. That is not based on us. No, I, I agree with you also. And it's just so interesting, the hunter and gatherer um, concept, because and they eat, they ate very paleo and keto anyway because they were burning so many calories. Like you said, they were literally hunting and gathering. 
our mm -hmm. hunting and gathering in modern day society is going to in and out Burger or Burger King and sitting in the drive through <laughs> or Starbucks having these frothy, huge sugary drinks. And you're hundred percent right. And, or we can sit on our couch, literally have Uber eats or Grubhub or whatever deliver to our coffee table. We don't even have to get up out of the door if we want to. So it's just, I mean, it's such, I don't want to say a lazy mentality or lifestyle, but our conveniences are really getting in the way. I believe also with the, you know, attribution to obesity. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, there's definitely a huge amount of lifestyle factors involved in the obesity epidemic. And, you know, what you just said, I, like, I'm just, we're looking at each other on video and I can see your refrigerator is like 10 feet behind you. And that's how it is for most people. And fortunately, um, for, you know, fortunately hunger for most people in America is not a huge thing. In fact, it's, it's the opposite problem. And so we've, we've made it almost too convenient for ourselves to, have easy access to not only food all the time, but the food that you were mentioning that's pumped full of hormones and full of sugar and full of, um, there's actually this book that goes into, you know, food scientists have figured out how to make us eat more. It's called the bliss point. And so when you eat oh, a absolutely. combination of food, it like lights up your brain and, and releases the dopamine and makes you feel good. So like, there's pretty it much does. everything is working against us from a food perspective. For sure. And I'm so glad you said that because a lot of people get so upset. I mean, I've heard people say to some people, well, you just don't want to lose the weight bad enough. And honestly, like you said, it is sometimes not people's faults because the food scientists are so brilliant I used to work um, as an executive for General Mills and they had wonderful I mean it's very tasty but even some of the berries and I don't want to rip on the company they're a wonderful company but like even cheer the the, the churros with the berries in it those are not real berries that is uh, you, you you would dissolve that into sugar that is sugar that turns into glucose and that is not a berry of any way shape or form in that in those cereals oh, and so it's <laughs> yeah it's hard so you're right it, it, we are pumped full of these chemicals and it is almost like alcohol or a drug that is a drug for us and when you eat when you eat it like you, you talked about in your other podcast you crash you crash and then that body craves more of that sugar mm -hmm. and could you just quickly break down what keto is and why you believe in it and how a carb is actually a sugar and glucose and why we should concentrate on the protein and the fat versus the carbs Yes. So there's so much in what you said there. So first I'll start out by just making just a simplified version. Yeah. You gave a really simplified version. <laughs> the simplified right. version of keto is, is very interesting to me because I think a lot of people overcomplicate it. And this is one of my kind of, I guess, pet peeves in the space with keto because it is confusing. It's very confusing. And so how the keto diet originally started was as a treatment for children with epilepsy. So children that had treatment resistant epilepsy or before we had good drugs to treat epilepsy, they figured out that getting a body's body to produce ketones would calm their brain down and prevent seizures. So really it was a very wonderful discovery for these kids to have some kind of way to manage a, a disease that there was no way to manage before that. So that they, the fact that they discovered ketones really help um, your brain and act as an anti-inflammatory anti agent in the body, it's, it's pretty amazing. But how most people come to keto now is not for seizure management, but it's to lose weight. That's what most people go for it for. Most people don't even know all the wonderful other benefits like the brain function improvements and the mental clarity and the extra energy that you get from it. And the fact that there's a bit of a metabolic advantage to being in ketosis where your body actually burns up to 300 more calories each day, just by the way that you're eating. So there's, there's so many other benefits to it that I hate to full focus solely on weight loss, but that is why a lot of people find it. And so the distinction there for me in what keto is, is the therapeutic keto diet version that was for epilepsy can be quite different from how you might eat as a like a quote unquote keto person on a day to day basis. So the therapeutic keto diet, you would have up to at the minimum, probably 70% of your calories coming for fat. If you had really treatment resistant epilepsy, you might even go up to 90% of your calories from, from fat. And that is to create a high level of ketones to calm down your brain. It's for a very specific purpose for just keto diet most people would just be better off if they just ate whole foods even if some of those whole foods included things like the starchier things like a sweet potato or a, a white potato or a, like more um you know certain fruits that aren't super high carb could be maybe included but you know the fact is most people 
or some people on a diet do better with a little bit more restriction. And I think that's part of the beauty of it. So if you're kind of cutting out those foods that are going to kick, quote unquote, kick you out of ketosis. And I kind of hate that word too, because I'm like, you, you don't have to be in ketosis all the time, okay? Right, it's not natural. That's kind of weird to be in that, that long. Well, and I don't know if it's bad or good. That probably remains to be seen. I don't think it's an unnatural state because it's a state that your body is metabolically designed to be able to tolerate and thrive on. In fact, we would have all starved to death if we weren't have the body had the ability to be in ketosis because your brain, yeah, your brain needs a certain amount of glucose every day. And that's true. And that's something that in the past, they kind of used that as a reason why you should eat a certain amount of carbs. But the truth is your body can make all the carbs that you need. You can eat zero carbs every day and your brain will function perfectly. Interesting. And like you said, don't overcomplicate it because it's just like the Mediterranean diet. If, if people are worried about like, like you had said one podcast that you had a question of how much more fat should I be eating? And it's like, no, just eat natural whole foods like the Mediterranean diet and do what works best for you. So no, that's a good way to break it down. And also people you visit for a lot building muscle. Don't you think it's, it's a good way to build more muscle, the keto diet? Absolutely. It's a muscle sparing diet. So even though you might be if you're, protein, yes, definitely. The, Cause it's an adequate amount of protein. The protein recommendations from the, our dietary guidelines are simply a minimum to prevent deficiencies. It's not something that is actually an amount of protein that would be optimal for if you're looking for optimal, um, body function, optimal body composition, then you're going to be eating a higher amount of protein than what is recommended by the USDA. So for example, most people in our space and just food or protein focused people, not all keto people are not all low carb people, but all of these people doing research in this area, they're saying that the amount for optimal body composition is somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.8 to 1.2 grams of protein per pound of lean body weight. And that's kind of a minimum. If you're doing a lot of activity or particularly if you're doing resistance training, you might be going up to 1.5 to two grams per pound of lean mass of body weight to, for your protein. So I think the, that that's part of the beauty of it too. Once people start to get more protein and they have ketones in their body, which is muscle sparing, you put on more muscle. Whenever you have more muscle, your body naturally burns more calories a day because each pound of muscle exactly it means like almost 10 more and you can yeah. even burn while you sleep when you have more lean muscle mass but that's a good point and so cheryl how would you um how would someone go about getting their lean body mass or lean body weight versus their weight would they just go to get dexa scans or go to the doctor dex is the gold standard um also um, bot bod pod is quite good um, that's any the water one, isn't um, it? You, no, that's hydrostatic. That's also the gold oh, standard. Yeah. Hydrostatic is when you are submerged in water. That's one way to get body yeah. fat. Dex does another excellent and Bod Pod's probably the third best one. Sure. After that, you have calipers, you have scales that do it with bioelectrical impedance, yeah. but they're not very accurate. And, and they're, okay. they might be okay for trends over time kind of thing. But if you really want to get a good, accurate starting point, um, particularly if you are wanting to change your body composition, if you can find a place like that in your area, I highly recommend that you do it because you'll be able to see in the mirror and certainly on the scale, but especially if you're working out and building muscle, the scale number is not going to match up because the, you know, muscle's more dense. And so yeah. you and I could both weigh, be the exact same height and exact same weight, but one of us could have 15% body fat and one could have 30%. And those two people look very different, but they're the exact same weight. So the weight exactly. thing is not a very good measure. It isn't because bodybuilders have high BMIs, which is complete BS yeah. and they're solid muscle. So it really is not a good read. And I, I wish that the medical industry would change that because if someone's considered obese, obese that is in the best shape of their life. It's, it's really, really crazy. So no, that's a good breakdown because when you said 0.8 to 1.2 grams per lean body weight, someone could take and they could be 200 pounds but it's full of fat and then that's not lean body weight and right. they're eating way too many way too much protein so. well and another way to do it without knowing your exact lean mass you can also do it just by total weight but you might say say you're actually overweight or obese and you need to lose weight you're not super muscular we're not talking about those people we're talking about people that are obviously higher body fat that want to lose sure, like a mesomorph mm -hmm. then you can take your just take your um ideal body weight so if you look at a height weight chart say you weigh say you're five five as a woman and you weigh 200 pounds now and you look on the height weight chart and you're 
an optimal weight for you might be more like around 140 or 150, you can just use that number. Oh, that's a good point. Okay, that's that's an excellent. I just thought you had to get the the actual thing done. So it would be your goal, your goal mm -hmm. of what you want to do. That's great. Thank you. Um, would you say that women have a, a more difficult time with the keto diet than men in general? I don't know. It's interesting because there is a lot of talk about that, yeah. and um, people worry that it has um, hormonal effects, like on your thyroid or different things. I just think women in general are more complex creatures on multiple levels. And we're harder on ourselves, maybe? Yeah, well, there's definitely that. But it's also true that just your hormones change for women on a very cyclical basis every month. And so during different parts of your cycle, and I've heard multiple people talk about this, you actually are, are expending more calories in I think it's the first phase of your cycle. I have to look this up, but there's some part of your cycle where you're expending more calories. So the fact that you're feeling more snacky or more hungry is related to true bodily hunger. That's that's reasonable because your body's using more calories. So I think in some cases, knowing those sorts of things about a woman's body can help you, particularly if your goal is weight loss or weight maintenance. If you know that the first part of your cycle, that you're gonna be burning 300 more calories a day and that you're naturally gonna be a little more hungry, well, that frees you up to give yourself permission to eat those extra calories during that time frame and not feel guilty about it. And also know that it's like two to 300 calories that can make all the difference. Cause if you're trying to stay on whatever your weight loss calorie amount is, but your body's suddenly expending this much more energy, well, you're more likely to have a binge or go overboard yes. because you'll get way too hungry. So just going up a few, you know, a hundred or 200 calories during that time of your cycle, it could make all the difference because you'll just, you won't feel as hungry and you won't then get into that cycle where you're trying to restrict yourself so much and then you end up going way overboard. I'm so glad you said that. I'm gonna tell one of my best friends in New York, she's on a big show and we, we have craft services on, on set all the time in entertainment. Cookies galore. I mean, it's the best best food you've ever seen in your life. And she just had her period and she was just like, oh my God, I, I've gained so much weight. I'm glad, I'm gonna tell her, blitz in the beginning, add an extra 250 calories so you can be proactive about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's a really good point um, that you said that. And it would make sense that we burn more calories because we're our body's really working hard to release an egg and things like that. So exactly. yeah, and that's really good because I know a lot of couples I know a lot of couples that have started keto together and the woman gets so frustrated because like he's dropping weight and he's being sexy and here I am doing he's slaving away and then he, he told me I don't want it bad enough and I hate that when someone says something some, to somebody else who's trying to lose weight well you're not trying hard enough or you don't want it bad enough like you said there are so many factors sleep hormones everything that has is going on in people's bodies so no I, I appreciate that you raised that point now can you tell as we're going into the holidays it's a time where people are, are some, some, some are worried. Some people want to stay at maintenance. Some people want to lose. Some people are worried about the social aspects of if they go home and perhaps they're a vegan and they're going home to their farm family in like in Louisiana or something like, or Wisconsin in my case. Um, how do you suggest, first of all, how would you approach the holidays as, as someone who's trying to be, keep on track of their goals? And I know you hate that word, keeping on track. So <laughs> yeah. that's a good, it is, it's, 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 it almost insinuates that no one's on track or something like that. Yeah, so, I don't, I need to figure out a better way to say that, but that, but, but people understand that. I don't know. Like keeping yourself accountable maybe. Yeah, but then something, again, that's something like that is, reaction. something like that is much better. <laughs> this exactly. Is, it has such a ne negative connotation, but yet when you say it, people know what you mean. Um, exactly. It's just, it. nobody wants to hear that. Right. Like, <laughs> I am on track my goals. What do you mean? Stay in your lane, you know? So yeah, it's true. So um, a couple of little things. What could people do? Just maybe a couple tips and tricks to just stay in their lane. <laughs> yeah. Well, my biggest tip is first, well, first of all, I did, I just, it's funny that you brought this up because I just did a whole episode on this on my podcast that I put out, it came out Wednesday. So we're recording this on a Friday. So it just came out two days ago. So if you're hearing this later, it's I'll already link out. that. I'll link that. Um, it's already out and you can listen to the whole thing. But I think the most important thing is first identify what your goal is. Is your goal... I would highly recommend to anybody that's been in weight loss mode, it's always good to take diet breaks anyway. It's good for your metabolism, it's good for your soul, it's good for your brain, all of those things. So 
I would first suggest consider over the holidays that maybe you take a diet break if you've been a person that's been trying to lose weight for a while. But that doesn't mean let's go ballistic. All that means is if your goal is still to lose weight at some point after the beginning of the new year, I would just shoot for maintaining your weight during the holidays, just a maintenance level. So you go to maintenance calories, which for most people is going to be, you know, as much as five to 700 calories more a day than when you're in diet mode. And that'll give you automatically more flexibility over the holidays to, you know, indulge in your favorite dessert if that's what you're looking forward to, or to have, you know, maybe an extra glass of wine if that's something that you're into, something like that. So I'd first identify your goal. And, you know, it is still possible to lose weight during the holidays. And certainly if you just don't feel like for whatever reason that you can let that go right now, maybe there's a, a major health issue why you really need to be focused on losing weight, if that's the case for you then I think you have to identify that as a goal and, and just tell yourself that you're going to stay on track. But I would still recommend, instead of taking a diet break for the whole holidays, I would recommend taking two days a week. And this is just good practice anyway to keep your metabolism going higher, to stay two days a week at maintenance level. And so again, that'll give you more flexibility. You could do one of those days if you know you're going to a holiday party, then just save that uh, maintenance level day for the party day. And that way it gives you a little bit more flex in there. So I think there's a lot of ways you can do it, but it really depends on identifying your goal first. And that's what I think confused a lot of people. Cause I think some people go into it and they maybe don't even consider what their real goal is or what they'd like the outcome to be, or, you know, what types of things are going to be dealing with over the holidays. Do you have tons and tons of events to go to? It's, it's definitely going to be more challenging, but if you have a mindset and a goal ahead of time, it'll just make those decisions during all of these extra events a little easier. I like that. And when you say a couple of days a week that you would add the five to 700 more, just to like make sure it's a deficit surplus, even amount, would you, do you call that reverse dieting? Is that Some people do. Day? I just like calling it a diet break just for, cause you're just maintenance level days. It's not like you're sure. really necessarily going. I feel like the reverse diet in, at least in my mind is more like when people are doing it on a consistent basis. So for like weeks and weeks kind of titrating up calories. Yeah. So this yeah. is more like just a, a temporary small thing that you're doing, but I do think that long-term it can really help keep your metabolism going. Cause you know, there have been plenty of studies on this long-term calorie restriction will reduce your metabolism. And it's not just from the weight you lose. Cause as you get to be a smaller person, your metabolism obviously goes down and that's totally normal because just yeah. you're not maintaining a 200 pound frame anymore. You're maintaining 150 pound frame or whatever it is. So that, that makes sense. But then there's this additional slowdown in your metabolism that comes from long-term calorie restriction. So I just think taking a little break every once in a while is one of the better things that you can do for yourself. And it kind of keeps you sane too. I mean, if you're that strict, it's like, you've got to live your life. That's Absolutely. And especially during the holidays, that's what makes it so challenging. And you know, the other thing I said in the podcast is, Hey, maybe if you're a person who doesn't mind putting on a few extra pounds now and then for whatever purpose, I mean, it is the winter. It's kind of ancestrally consistent that we might sure. have a little extra storage. If you mentally can accept, okay, maybe I, you know, gain three to five pounds over the holidays. If that's cool for you, that can be a goal too. And then you can just be, have a little more freedom. So it's all about what level of freedom you want and what the goal associated with that is. Absolutely. And and as far as fashion goes, we're bit wearing bigger jackets. We have bigger <laughs> clothes, fluffy sweaters. And, but then again, to keep yourself accountable of, okay, you, you're covering that up, but you know in your head that you may not be following your goals. So, but it's just funny. I mean, I follow a lot of the fashion trends and it shows that, I mean, obviously we're away from skinny jeans, but because of the <laughs> pandemic, all the jeans now are going back to like the mom jean look, mm -hmm. bell bottoms, just yeah. because of, of the indulgence. And also, you know, athleisure wear is getting bigger and bigger and better. But it also goes to show people are working from home and we want a better work-life balance anyway. And I do know that the pandemic, as you know, is yourself caused a lot of issues with, with weight gain and things like that. Because oh, yeah. of the gyms being shut down, depression, I, I, and you study psychology, mm -hmm. the depression was huge and isolation. And, and we look to food because, like you referred to it as before, is, it's a drug. It make, it's dopamine. It makes us feel great. And food doesn't talk back. It doesn't yell at us. It doesn't make us feel like we're less than. But then it's a vicious cycle, and people can go into you know the, the snack modes and then feel bad. But anyway, no, I like how you broke that down. Taking a little diet break, staying at maintenance, by adding 500 to 7 calories, it's 5 to 700 calories, a day, a couple of days a week, especially on the party days. I think that's very, um, that's very doable for sure. So, but it's also hard because people are so much more busy and they may not be able to get to the gym and things like that. So 
for people to kind of keep keep that in mind as well. Yeah, so. and I think that's a good point that you bring up because I always like to say that if you're if if weight loss is your goal, it's ninety percent um, the combination of sleep, stress, and what you're eating. Ten percent might be working out. Really, to me, working out is for physical cardiovascular health, for making your muscles stronger and to keep you sane and healthy mentally. It's not really for weight loss, in my opinion. I, I mean, I think people can really go overboard in that direction with it. I think you should absolutely move your body every single day. I like to promote joyful movement, whatever that is for you. So it's easier to do and, and easier to be consistent with it. Um, but if you, you've really, if you're worried about gaining weight and stuff, I just think you do have to pay a little bit more attention to what you're eating, what, how you're sleeping and your stress levels. That would be the more things to focus. And I think if you're busy and you don't have as much time to do like a big workout, still just having like 10 minutes or breaking it up throughout the day. So just try to get something in and because it's more for your sanity than anything else. It I think. is. And getting outside and breathing fresh air or just being with friends, just a little walk. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Cheryl, because I always tell people it's 90% in the kitchen of, of what, of the whole weight loss thing. And when you say sleep, that is huge. I mean, there are people that are just overly worked and they will be on that treadmill. I've gone to the gym and there's people on the treadmill for like two hours. I'm like, I can't even do 20 minutes with, with sometimes. It's just like, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a big thing. And also just what you said, like the little mini cardio things. I tell people 10 minutes after breakfast, lunch and dinner, just take a walk outside. And it also for the sanity. Love that. It's like that. That's perfect. That's 30 minutes a day. That's super easy. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as keto in the holidays, I noticed you had some really interesting recipes <laughs> on, on your, on your um, YouTube and the podcast. And can you just kind of tell us a couple of the things that you uh, have done, like even your Thanksgiving pumpkin pie, what did you do to, to keto size it, if, if you will. Yeah, there's. it's interesting because most people, I think probably one of the scariest or two of the scariest things that they worry about if they're gonna practice this sort of lifestyle and going lower carbs, we've all become very accustomed to having desserts on a near daily basis, if not multiple times a day kind of basis. So that's just kind of what happened in our culture um, over time. And then they are afraid they're gonna miss bread and they're gonna miss pasta. <laughs> and so, and you know, it's funny when I, people talk to me about this stuff, they're like, oh, well, I know you don't like that stuff. I'm not really, no, I love that stuff. <laughs> I love that Who stuff. Who doesn't, exactly. Right. If we but, trained yourself to not like it, but it's not the case. Right, no, but I have just, from, from very serious health reasons, both in my personal past and in my, I have a ton of cancer in my family. So I just am really committed as a goal for myself because of, those things that this is why I choose to do what I do. I'm not saying everybody has to Cancer do it. Cancer loves sugar, as we know. Cancer thrives on sugar. It so. absolutely does. And so for me, I just have to say, no, I can't. I don't think I can do that for my long-term health. I want to be around when, you know, we have grandkids or something, hopefully, or, yes. or just be able to move well and feel well still as I get older, because I'm almost nearly 50 now. And like the way things are hurting, I'm like, I can only imagine <laughs> what's going to happen. So. You look like you're 24, oh, Cheryl. It's the good lighting in here. <laughs> no, but I do think it, it also can be attributed to healthy lifestyle and um, I and good genes. Obviously, I think that helps. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty fortunate, but um, but the, I want to keep it that way, right? So I'm trying to make these kinds of choices, but certainly you don't have to be super strict. I just like to tell people going for like one percent better every day and just a slow transition into a lower carb lifestyle. Again, I don't think everybody necessarily has to go all the way to keto for some people for certain purposes. It might be really a good idea. Like if you're, if you have diabetes or pre-diabetes, it's really an amazing tool for managing that. And there's plenty of research out on that at this point. Um, it's also really good for people that need really high level brain functioning. So for me, I write all the time. And so for me to be in ketosis, it gives me like, I feel like an extra edge of just being super yes clear and, and focused intermittent fasting so you and i both feel the same way about intermittent fasting mm -hmm. i've never had more energy and clarity in my life as when i intermittent fast yeah and people are like oh you're starving yourself i'm like no i know you want to see my meal in two hours it's <laughs> enormous yeah right <laughs> I mean, it's huge and i look so forward to it yeah so i'm really glad that you said that and because it, it is important um so 
what what would you put in that pumpkin pie for the keto? Oh, sorry, so that was the original question. I got off track there. But no, I'm, I, I ask a lot at, at once. So I <laughs> Fortunately, um, most recipes are fairly easy to make keto. There are certain things that they're not. There's like no awesome keto bread. I'm just gonna say it because there's not. <laughs> I think if, if you don't have any self, serious health problems and you really love bread, just have a piece of amazing bread on occasion if that's your thing, you'd be much better off because the substitutes, have their own issues. For example, almond flour is a very prevalent substitute in keto and it's fine for most people. However, if you happen to be um, sensitive to oxalate, so if you've ever had a kidney stone before, they'll tell you go on a low oxalate diet. Yeah. And it can cause other issues in the body as well, high, high levels of oxalates. But if you don't have that issue, keto flour is the main one. Um, but like I said, it's got its own thing because it can have quite a lot of calories. It um, can have a lot of oxalates. Um, but so for the keto pumpkin pie, that is the crust is um, almond flour. And then you just use a sugar substitute in the mix. Now, pumpkin does have a slightly higher carb content by nature, but it's still really easy to fit it in keto macros. And so really what's in the filling is just um, pumpkin puree and an alternative sure. sweetener and then the typical spices that you would do for any pumpkin pie. So it's pretty easy. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, I would say, would you say that the pumpkin puree would almost be almost be equivalent to like a sweet potato with that much, or there's a lot more glucose in that? In, there's a lot more uh, glucose in carbs the in the sweet potato. Puree. It's, um, oh, okay. yeah, the pumpkin puree, or maybe they're about equivalent. I don't know, I haven't, I mean, I obviously looked at it when I did the recipe, but um, sweet yeah. potatoes are more carby than people think. I mean, they're, sure. they're not only full of the, just the fiber carbs and stuff, which are usually fine for keto, but it does have a higher amount of sugar in it naturally. Exactly. Now. Um, on the snacks, there are so many keto snacks out there. I mean, you go to a, <clears throat> a grocery aisle, it is everywhere. And I've been so interested in looking at the nutrition labels. Well, number one, they're also very expensive. Mm -hmm. If you have to pay for that, like I saw a keto cereal the other day in a health food store. I mean, the bag was like so small and it was $17. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, this is not, it's just, it's not doable, but I guess, I mean, it, it was perfect keto macros, but come on, that is not, that is not sustainable or doable unless you have that kind of money. And we don't know, and like you said earlier, a lot of these things that are substitutes, there's fillers in there. So if you take out something, you have to add something else. And there usually could be high in things that could ca cause gastric problems. I and mean, some people get like massive diarrhea or constipation mm -hmm. from some of the additives or takeaways to, to make things taste good. Um, so I think that taking it with a grain of salt and really looking at, instead of the snacks that are packaged, unless you're in a bind and it's convenient, really sticking to the whole foods and like you said more mediterranean diet based keto types of things yeah you're spot on with that because those a lot of those keto snack foods are just garbage really i mean it's no yes. different than eating some other in fact, like chips it's the same thing i had a brand reach out to me today um that wanted to do a promotion and they it was for two kind of new snack foods and one was like some kind of nut cluster chocolate nut cluster thing and the other was um Oh, like a peanut butter cup sort of thing. So I went and looked at the ingredients and one of them, it was either the first or the second ingredient was soluble corn fiber, which they say has a low GI index, but I've tested it with my, um, I, when I've had a continuous glucose monitor on or even just pricking my finger, it definitely lights up my glucose when I have that. So sol soluble corn fiber is one to look out for. Um, and then they were also in one of them using a sweetener called maltitol. Now, a lot of these alternative sweeteners, you mentioned the GI, first of all, the GI with <laughs> maltitol is a big issue, but not only that, a lot of these less good alternative sweeteners will raise your blood sugar as much or more as real sugar. So you just have to be careful. My top three that are good keto sweeteners, number one is allulose. There's actually two research studies out there on allulose that shows as it's metabolized with your body, it will actually take glucose out of your body with it. So that's a pretty amazing one. And that would be my top pick. Then my second pick- Is there pick, a brand, Cheryl, that would be allulose that people would know? Uh, yeah, I, and I actually have a link for this on my site. RX Sugar is one, but there's multiple ones um, that have it now. And a lot of uh, really good keto companies are starting to use allulose. The problem with it before is the way that they have to do it on the label. They can't say it's like a, a non-nutritive sweetener in the same way. So they have to count the carbs from it, but they're not true carbs. They're not processed by your body at all. So it makes things on the label funky, which is why it wasn't as popular before. Sure. But now that people are starting to understand that more of the really good keto brands are starting to use allulose. Um, 
So that's the first one. Second one, stevia, most people know that's been pretty commonly around for a while. I will say there was some recent research on that one and a lot of the alternative sweeteners that show it might have an effect on the gut microbiome. So if you're really concerned about that, maybe just do a little more research on that on your own. I, I've, I've been planning to do that article for such a long time on the keto sweeteners or the alternative sweeteners, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, and then the third one that is pretty common is erythritol. The only one thing about that is a little bit negative is some people, it kind of can have a cooling sensation in the mouth and some people don't like that. Um, but it is another one that's kind of one of the better ones. Is it, does it have menthol in it or is it just kind of the way it's- It's just something about the way it lands. I don't know why, but- oh, That's interesting. And then would that would there be a brand name for that one or is it just a Probably the one? most common ones that people know about are Swerve and- Oh, sure, um, okay. Yeah. And you can find, you can actually find that one in most national grocery stores now, which didn't. Yeah, very much so. It's very, very accessible. A lot of these, a lot of these products. However, I am always concerned with, I, I do a lot with the homeless and um, people with, you know, foods, uh, just uh, the food deserts, um, mm -hmm. especially in Los Angeles. I mean, you're, you go outside any area, there's homeless everywhere. And that is another problem. I mean, just giving, a lot of companies give, give food to the kids. And that's wonderful, of course, because a lot of them are extremely malnourished and, and starving, but it's already starting them out on the products like General Mills, Kellogg's, Cheetos, Pepsi. Mm. But again, if they're not eating at all, I'd rather have them eat this. But as we know, your body already me metabolically processes that as children. And we have such a high rate of obesity in children today. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's going to perpetuate unless we do something about it more. But it's hard because these food companies give a lot of money. And, and, and if we take it away, Where's the funding and things like that? So it's such a vicious cycle, but I have such a passion for that. So yeah, and that's anyway. two separate. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like obviously, if people are starving, whatever they can eat, it's gotta, yes. it's gotta be the way it is. But by the same token, you're it does create this sort of cycle, and yeah, it's it's a difficult it question does. for sure. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, I want to do that in the future for sure, um, um, long term. What are, the, what are some of the specifics that you love to cover um, and how can people approach you and what are, what are your programs about? Would it just be one-on-one? -on -one? So to make your business grow further, I wanna just make sure that we support you in every way, shape and form. Yeah, so I put out tons of free content. Um, you already mentioned my YouTube channel, my podcast, my website, all of that has you know free keto recipes, free articles about, and I always put the research links in for everything. I'm super passionate about that just based on my history. Um, but I'm Heal, Nourish, Grow everywhere on every channel. The only place I'm not that is LinkedIn and um, myself, Cheryl McColgan there. <laughs> so I'm pretty easy to find. Um, and as far as programs or anything, I am working on a few things right now um, that might produce some programs in the future if people want to work on a, what would be a more affordable basis? Because right now I just do one-on-ones if, you know, and that's just like I said, aside from all of my free content, but I do occasionally work with people um, in that way. And I do have a cookbook that is out any minute. <laughs> We're kind of doing the final edits on it. Um, oh, and I've got yes. another couple of projects in the works um, as far as education. And uh, we'll have more information on that soon. I, it's nothing I can really divulge yet, but um, my next several weeks uh, are going to be extremely busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then we're heading to the holidays. You're going to be very busy. Yeah, because of course I still have to cook for Thanksgiving and all that too. Exactly. I think you should hire at this point, but it's hard because even when you go to a restaurant or hire somebody, you don't know what, what's going into that food. And that's, but that's why restaurants are so delicious because they add the olive oil, add the olive oil and things like that. What is right. your cookbook going to be called? Can you reveal that or is that? A oh yeah, no, it's um, Easy Weeknight Keto and they're all very oh, clean. Great keto recipes, but they're all done in under 30 minutes because I know big, um, you know, concern for a lot of people is obviously time, as you just mentioned, being busy and in our family is no different. Our kids are running off to sports all the time and, uh, we're looking for, you know, easy meals that we can make. And so whenever I, whether it's putting the recipes on my site or like this cookbook, I do try to make all the recipes really, uh, easy in some way. Some of them are in a crock pot, you know, some of them are things that you make you know, you might make it ahead the night before or marinate it the night before, and then you get home from work and you just boom, put it on the grill and it's, you know, done in 15 Great. minutes, something like that. So, so very sustainable and very approachable. Mm -hmm. Um, really quick question on that. Do you add uh, the air fryer recipes to that or do you stick away for, stay away from that? I know I love that. I have an air fryer and I love it. <laughs> and I actually um, have a great company that I work with for that called Aria, but I don't, I haven't done a lot of recipes for it, uh, but it's, 
you know, it's wonderful for the most basic stuff. It's great for reheating things. It's great for making things crispy. Uh, it's great for, you know, things that, you know, our kids are like any other kids. They still eat a lot of packaged things, unfortunately, even though I would prefer that they didn't. And it's wonderful so for heating up that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but maybe in the future. Sure. Do you, do you see any danger in the air fryers as, of going like they're healthier, but they're still fryer? Or do you pretty much think that they are healthy? It's hell. It's just an oven is really all it is. I think the air okay. fryer part of it is it circulates the air in a way that it can crisp up skin and stuff without having to actually fry it or without having to um, add extra oils and stuff if that's something you're concerned about. So I would say it's, it's very healthy. It's just, um, it's really, it's, I mean, can I say it? It's like a marketing thing. <laughs> Oh, totally. Actually, you know, that actually helps a lot because I always think if you're fryer, then that goes against everything. But okay, I'm glad that you broke that down that way. It's, it's really just like a little toaster oven kind of thing. That's really all it is. Perfect. Okay, thanks for that. And then just really quickly, your goals. And, and um, but then again, you said the cookbook and you've got some projects. So we will always support you and I'll put all the links to your podcast and your, and your, um, your schedule. Do you have any kind of like programs that people can say, well, you've got the one-on-one -on -one or a group session. What if, what if two women are best friends and they want to do something together? Would you do like a duo or anything like that? Sure. I'm always open to whatever. I'm, I'm not real rigid in how I work with the, I just like to help people if I can. Sure, and so sure. in whatever way people like to work, I do think having some kind of program. So it generally makes it more affordable for people because obviously when you're paying for an hour of somebody's time, um, it's always more expensive than if you have some kind of group setting. So, you know, if, or if you had a bunch of friends that wanted to be like accountability buddies and lose weight together or work on their habits of getting better sleep habits together or whatever it is, you know, I'm, I'm always open. I can't promise that I can always make it happen, but, um, I'm, sure. I'm always open to like, just trying to help however I can. That sounds great. And then do you have, um, nutrition plans or are you allowed to do that? Are you you're not, a, you're not a dietitian, correct? Not a dietitian. As far as I know, though, there's really no restriction on, I mean, plenty of people in the space are not dietitians. In fact, most dietitians will get in trouble <laughs> with this. I've gotten in trouble as a fitness instructor because yeah. people have asked me, what do I do? And like, I almost got like in LA, you can like go to jail. I mean, it's very dangerous here because there's so many people in fitness here. Yeah. And I, the speak that I learned the hard way, cause I, I almost got nailed was this is what I do, but that does not mean that works for you. This is what I do. Right. And that's what, yeah, that's the only thing that I can say. Um, but you did do clinical, you did do clinical research. So, I mean, you, you're, you are very into dietetics, but it just, you're right. The degree is even nutritionist. You can't say certain things unless you have a registered dietetics degree. Yeah. And most of them, their, their paradigm and their training is the standard American diet, the food pyramid. So you won't find sure. a whole lot of them, um, doing keto. Although again, that is changing. Cause now we're, like I said, there's so much good research now coming out about using keto to reverse and diabetes and then sure. that it's, it's going to take time, but eventually maybe we'll get there. Um, but in the meantime, I don't really, I can tell people like how to deal with meal plans and stuff. I haven't written any myself. I've had people ask that. It's just not something I'm super passionate about because like I said, I'm pretty yeah. boring with my food and it's probably a disservice to them because, um, I know I realize it's because I've thought about this stuff and done this stuff for a long time. It seems easy to me. And I feel like it should just seem like that for everybody. And I know that that's not yeah. the case. That's the, the way you get when you're in a kind of subject matter expert on anything, right? It seems easy to you yeah. and you forget that when people are, are just learning about it, it's, it's more challenging. So I can definitely see how a meal plan would be helpful. I just, it's not something I've done yet, but, um, I feel yeah. the same way and I'm very regimented. I, I like to eat the same things every day. It's easy. It's almost like Bill Gates wore a black turtleneck and jeans every day. It just <laughs> keeps you, it keeps you, I mean, it, it just, it's more streamlined. I don't like a lot of clutter. I don't want to go and have all these options and it's like oh you know I also and then you know you're just you just you feel more disciplined with everything else and that also clears the brain I like to be very very um like you're a writer I have all these things going on at the same time as well and you want to have a clear brain we don't forget things I mean I do see people that have monstrosities of different diets with all the sugar and they're always either forgetting something or they're always extremely fatigued or running all over the place and I'm not blaming the diet or anything like that but it does keep you more clear mm -hmm. when you intermittent fast and and kind of stick to a plan so. well just because you brought that up a quick thing for people to just in case somebody ever hears this uh is that they are calling alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes now I and so that. there is a huge connection between having too much sugar in the body and brain function. And I think that that trickles down even into just daily cognitive trouble, um, because there's another study that I'm aware of that shows that 
even when there's impaired glucose uh, metabolism in the brain, which is what happens in both normal aging and Alzheimer's, when there's impaired glucose metabolism, the beauty is your brain can still always utilize ketones. So the reason that the neurons in your brain could die or get damaged over time from Alzheimer's or something is because they're, they're, it's like they don't have any food, so they're dying. But if you have ketones, even if your brain has trouble processing glucose, you can still use the ketones. So that's pretty amazing. And I think, unfortunately, not a lot of people know about that. So I just try to mention it whenever somebody talks to me, because I'm like, if somebody out there has a family member with Alzheimer's, or if you're just noticing age-related cognitive decline, changing your diet can really make a big impact on that. Absolutely, you know, that's a very good point. And they're, they're doing more and more research on that. Yep, you're about the sixth person I've heard talk about the type three diabetes of, of the new Alzheimer's. Oh, good, so, I'm glad people are talking about it more because I just think it's absolutely. so important. It is, and as we as we move through, people are living longer and nobody wants to see people go see now, especially in their family. And it, it is seems to be more prevalent due to the type three diabetes with all the sugars. So mm -hmm. thank you for saying that. Well, Cheryl, it has been such a pleasure. Um, Ms. Cheryl from Ohio, originally from Louisiana. I love it. Do you do, do change some of your Louisiana food into keto just to make it more tasty or you don't touch that? That is, stays as Louisiana food and you're not. You're not <laughs> no, I absolutely do. And you know, there might be a day where there's a whole, you know, book of that or something. <laughs> Good, the, the, the gumbos and the, oh, so wonderful. Yeah. The beignets. Oh, I love it. Well, Cheryl, thank you so very much. I'll put all of your podcast notes or all your um, social medias, all your websites, everything about you, and then link to, to your YouTube channel, of course, because that's really fascinating. Um, and she's got incredible recipes on there. So I don't, I'm not even going to tell you about them. You have to go to her YouTube to see them. <laughs> so, so that would be her YouTube channel at Heal Nourish Grow. You can also find her on all the socials at Heal Nourish Grow and on LinkedIn at Cheryl McColgan. And I wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving to you and your family and friends. And this is actually going to go up the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was so lovely meeting you. And I really just appreciate you uh, doing this. It was really fun. And that was Miss Cheryl McColgan from Heal, Nourish, Grow. And we both wish you a joyous and fun and festive Thanksgiving. Enjoy it with your family and friends. This is a year to celebrate, to give thanks. And again, we appreciate you for listening. And please rate and subscribe to the show on iTunes. You can also listen on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Luminary, Tuned In, or Believe.com. You can reach out to me for any comments or questions. Do you like comment on the show at Amy Daniels or at Amy Daniels Actress? And I wish you a great week. And I thank you very much for listening to Believe. So, Cal.